we meet once again for me to unpack another handful of things from my past in the fundamental Christian church to try to make sense of where I was and how I got here and what to do now. Let's bridge the last one to this one. Let's talk a bit about getting disqualified from the ministry. Because I mentioned before those times when um, like a mega church pastor would uh, it would come out to the light of day that he was cheating on his wife and um, you don't have to hunt around too much to find that's a thing that's happened across different churches. If you grew up in the kind of church I grew up in, I imagine you're familiar with this idea of becoming disqualified from the ministry due to moral failings. What's interesting to pull apart is consider how long any of those affairs went on before they were discovered. And then the minister was disqualified from the ministry. So if we were going to judge simply by how it played out, then apparently cheating on your wife is not what disqualifies you from the ministry. Getting caught is. Now, while this may sound like I am just picking things apart, the reason it's even worth mentioning is that shame is not a good thing. And, and it's a terrible thing to rely on as a primary motivator. And I think it is one of the major sicknesses unto death in the Christian church. Because it seems to me, from everything that I knew of that system, and the maneuvering that resulted in double lives within that system, it seems that instead of it being culturally normal for people to uh, develop trusting, open, vulnerable connections with one another. It became normal to just do your best in isolation because everything that could be called sin was so stigmatized and so shameful that you could develop enough cognitive dissonance to openly look down on it when you saw it in somebody else, especially a non-believer and end up having so many conversations where you're lamenting how much sin there is in the world, even if the things you're looking down on are things you also do when nobody's around to see you. So that's my opener for this episode, which let's say this episode's going to center on that compulsion to keep everyone else in line. So the next thing in connection with this overall topic is what about the separation of church and state? For instance, do you yourself uh, agree with the idea of separation of church and state? It seems that if we were to really take a fine tooth comb over it, a lot of the people in the church don't really commit to the idea of there being a separation between church and state because they keep trying to legislate moral change, such as in areas of freedom of choice. I am a little more libertarian in my leanings, and this has been only uh, amplified by the fact I spent six years in Pensacola Christian College and got a close-up look at what and what it does to the human psyche 
when you know you are in a place where it's run by rules and the rules work like a steamroller. It just carries on in a straight line. There's no room for context. There's the line and if you cross it, this, this will happen to you. I find that if people want others to change their minds, when they see their behavior as wrong, maybe even reprehensible. When has it ever been um, a, a fruitful approach to tell someone they, that they need to turn or burn? And when is it actually, when it's been a, an actual problem, when has it actually resolved the real heart issue to legislate a change? It seems to me that when people are not trying to control one another, they can have a healthy, positive dialogue. And sometimes minds will change. But when you make it all about rules, people find a way to do what they're going to do in the dark if they have to. So that next thought in connection with this idea of a separation of church and state is the big question. If you're part of the church, are you trying to hold people to the standards of your faith when they're not part of your faith? Are you trying to correct the rest of the world for not following your beliefs because you see your beliefs as absolute truth? And importantly, are you cutting people off or are you simply withholding love from people whose way of life differs from yours? A whole line of thinking very connected to this one is if you call yourself a believer, do you believe in the Holy Spirit? And if so, do you believe the Holy Spirit has the influence, indeed the power, to correct other people who are believers? Or have you decided that that responsibility is on you? And how's that going for you so far? These are questions that I circle back to. And I think some of these things have become so uh, normalized for all the sheep to try to shepherd one another. That again, it becomes a shame party. And maybe that's why it, it, it seems so much more common for Christian people to, to teach their children to do all things without murmuring and complaining while at the same time being kind of kind of some of the most negative people you'll ever meet always complaining about whatever's happening in the government complaining about things in a way that communicated that uh their general outlook was really powerlessness like almost like they were just waiting it out hoping that jesus would come sweep everybody up off the face of the earth uh, to destroy what was left an escapist theology not one that seemed primarily concerned with making things better here one that seemed more uh, interested in in judgment and and if and if convinced of anything then convinced that they were the favored ones, not for living a fruitful life, but for praying the right sinner's prayer to the right God. In practice, when you play it out to its conclusion, a lot of it seemed way more like speaking a magic spell rather than living a life that any benevolent God would be proud of. I don't believe that all Christians just want to see the world burn, but I think there's a lot to do. And I think there may even be a lot that would admit it. Which speaks to a big paradigm shift. Because, of course, that's not going to be the theology of every church you can attend. There are going to be those who believe in stewarding the earth. Which is where it all began, right? Depending on where you go, maybe, maybe you were taught that all of that was out the window after the fall of man. But generally... I think people have some sense of humanity being given rule over this earth to care for it, to foster growth here, to make it a good, habitable place. So it's interesting, and interesting is the wrong word, but to me it is interesting. 
for us to be at a time in history where a lot of people who call themselves believers seem to be looking forward to the end of the world and thinking that they're going to magically escape from it. And the other thing that I'll mention in this video is what about hell? If you were also a church kid, I would be interested to know how much has the hell doctrine overshadowed the whole of your spiritual paradigm? I was one of the kids, and there are many, who didn't just pray that sinner's prayer to become a Christian, but in fact, prayed it, I'm sure, hundreds of times and maybe thousands because many were the night when I wondered if I really meant it and if Jesus was really living in my heart. So not knowing what else to do, I just went through the motions again and hoped that I meant it enough for it to... affect my eternal destination. Even saying that in words sounds like there must be something very wrong to be sold this idea that this is how you get ultimate security and for it innately to come with this deep insecurity that you can be sure of any of it, even if you're sold on wanting to be sure. But then to see how the hell doctrine affected the way that we interacted with people. I didn't go out on, you know, what was called door-to-door -door witnessing often. We were always uh, encouraged to, to go out on what was called Christian service uh, when I was in college. And those would be different kinds of things. I I did eventually get up the nerve to, to go out and try it occasionally while I was out there. I went once, I think we went to a park with some kids. There was one I went to that was um, Juvenile Justice Center. And one time I went door to door witnessing, which was weird. It was weird. You know, the first thing I'll say was that I grew up believing that was what I was supposed to do. and feeling guilty for not doing it, but also it felt so unnatural. I didn't really know how to say why it felt so unnatural. Now I do, but back then I just knew that I was failing at one of the basic things I was supposed to do as a Christian kid. Now I look back and I see it felt weird because it was weird. You're basically going to somebody you've never met before to ask them one of the deepest things you can talk to anybody about. Do they know where they're going to spend eternity? And if you can imagine what an intimate thing it is to give your heart to anything or anyone, then how strange is it to be approached by a stranger asking you to make a decision then and there for something that you may be hearing about for the first time? Seems like it wouldn't be the best approach to say, hey, have you ever thought about giving your life to the Lord? <laughs> well, what, you know, I'm surprised about all the questions that didn't come up from that. Well, okay, well, what, what? what? <laughs> because, because if I didn't have a point of reference for it, I think I'd have about five different questions about what do you even mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? Even starting at what do you mean by give my life? Or what do you mean by give my heart? I mean, you could see a lot of relationships where people have dated for a while and still wouldn't say they've given each other their heart. That's I just see that as a bigger deal and as a more sensitive thing than I would ask anybody to make a snap judgment about. You know, to look at a bunch of verses that you could put on a little tract, 
basically like a, a three by five, no cards worth of verses telling you, this is why we're all sinners. Here's what we have. Here's what Jesus did about it. Here's what you have to do about it to respond. And I get it potentially if something about that resonates in a person's spirit and if it, if it is just playing real to them. But barring some transcendent supernatural experience, it seems to me that there's a lot of people out there who have a lot of agendas and I just wouldn't be so quick to jump on board and say I'm giving my life to something if I'm hearing about it for the first time. But because of the way we were taught about hell, we were taught that there was an urgency about these things. That any day that goes by could be your last. And if you don't make a decision today to follow Christ, you could wake up in hell tomorrow. Because you never know when you're going to draw your last breath, and you never know if you'll successfully cross the street or be rolled over and pass into eternity. A lot of morbid thinking came with <laughs> fundamentalist Christianity, <laughs> including that whole preoccupation with, oh, well, uh, don't complain that you were made five minutes late. You don't know what you were spared from. For all you know, there could have been a deadly collision on the road, on the highway, and... and Maybe the, the Lord in, in his infinite mercy uh, made you late so that you wouldn't get in a head-on collision, you know. All these things that, w that we would make up. But the weird thing is how hell became a bigger motivator than love. And the twisted thing was how we were taught over and over again that love necessitated hell. That a loving God had to have there be a hell. So that those who didn't want him could have their choice honored. Now in hindsight, it, it sure seems to me that that was just a way that Christians were trying to force two opposing things to fit together in a way that they could live with. And I find it suspect that a doctrine of hell would become so much more an emphasis than a true gospel, which should be good news, not, not simply impending doom, but good news. And if it is good news, then not just a theory about love, but a love that you can have and know deeply in this life. Not just a carrot dangling on a string that you've got to wait until after you draw your last breath to get to. See, those sound like good formulas for tricking children into doing what you want them to do. Those don't sound like compelling or even logical rewards to offer to anybody that can think for themselves unless you have proof to back it up unless you have real life changes that are happening uh, i would like to take this moment to uh, reiterate what i've said in previous episodes which is that um, i'm not out to run this uh, smear campaign against the church at large and uh I'm even open to having my mind changed if there are those who have something of substance to share something that goes beyond just being able to show me chapter and verse for what they believe and maybe this is a good time to say if you've been watching and if you have real life experience that has shown the fruit of your christian beliefs i i don't want to make arguments back and forth but if you would like to make a response video to any of my videos, feel free to leave a link. I hope that if you do that, you'll really pay attention to my hangups and my sticking points and also recognize that the criticisms I'm coming here with are not completely uninformed. Remember, I spent about the first 30 years of my life in fundamentalist Christianity, only to become profoundly disappointed in 
this sense of wondering if it could be anything more than a carrot on a string. So even if somebody's response were to say, this is how Jesus changed my life, at this point, I would still need for them to be substantiating it with something more than just what somebody might fill in the blank with to say, this is how meditation changed my life, or this is how a 12 step program changed my life. Because if it's just randomly something that you can say, this focal point helped me to change my own life, it would still be hard for me to get on that bandwagon. I hope that makes sense. But I wanna wrap this video up, and to do that, let me just say, what if the way we were taught about hell was a faulty interpretation. And you know, there's been different teachings across different denominations and different faith systems. I find it interesting from the uh, Jewish friends that I've had conversations with that this doctrine of hell wasn't really part of Jewish consciousness. And this lends some credence in my mind to the idea that what we've come to conceive of as hell, like this fiery place of torment, may have actually been more metaphorical, even though it was a metaphor that drew from uh, a literal place, which was basically the garbage dump outside the city. Doesn't it seem more likely that this would be metaphorical than that it would be literal and be a brand new thing that nobody had ever heard of? Because how weird would it be for Jesus to start talking about this... Uh, afterlife of endless torture without explaining, oh, by the way, here's this thing that's not part of your paradigm, but let me introduce you to it. And it would be easy for a lot of people to give me pushback on this idea of it being metaphorical because I know you could go to, well, you could do a quick word search and come up with a list of verses that you would think would be proof that I can't just dismiss out of hand to say, well, no, he says this here and here and here and here. But I've heard a compelling argument that this idea of this unquenchable fire, that this is talking about a state of being and is not talking about a, a final destination for your indestructible spirit to just be kept in conscious torture in forever. And I have come to wonder, were these sacred writings giving us truth about different states of being? Was this idea of heaven the same thing that we'll hear other people talk about in terms of living at a higher frequency? And is this idea of hell, this destitute state of being, where you're not living for anything, you're in the isolation of living for yourself, you have unquenchable desires that you can try to feed and still feel just as empty at the end of trying to feed them. And at the end of this whole line of questioning, I ask myself, if hell is not a literal place of fiery torment, but is a metaphorical place, not a literal garbage dump outside the city, uh, we don't need to get this whole thing confused with the, like, f I think five or six different words that somehow people have uh, all rolled in as if they're all talking about this one specific eternal fiery place. If hell is a state of being and it is the soul's conscious torment, then I'm left wondering how many Christians alive today are there right now even with air still in their lungs.